to that. <laughs> if you'd like to turn with me to, to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and we'll read verses 1 through 13. He went away from there. He came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hand on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled at their, their unbelief. And he went about the villages teaching. And he called his twelve and began to send them out, excuse me, two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals and to put on two tunics and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and they proclaimed that, that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now, the theme song is we need singing in school, uh, school in Swahili. The same song is Swahili. No, they're going to do the same yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you sent your son to teach us what life with you truly is. And that Jesus lived among us not just for a couple of years, but he lived an entire life, showing us what life with you is like and providing a way for us to be in that life. And that you have called us to participate in that continued ministry even to this day. And we ask that you will make us into the people that we need to be so that we can see your great hand in our world today. And in your name we pray, amen. Today we have a couple of interesting stories to discuss. I really don't know where I'm going with this because I just spent a week in my hometown. And the, the America the Beautiful, the, the amber waves of grain, that's, that's what I've been focused on the, the past week and, and, and next week because it's harvest time and, and we focus on those amber waves. And anyone that lives on a farm gets very stressed out when they can't get out there. So. So I don't know exactly where this is going, but there's something amazing about hometowns. There are a place where we can relax and, and get back to our roots. I am, no matter how long I live in a city, a country boy at heart. I say this not because I enjoy country music or enjoy wearing cowboy boots or a cowboy hat. I say this because it's who I am. That's, although I tend to, to be seen in, in, in that manner sometimes, I'll be seen wearing boots, I'll be seen wearing a hat. I almost always have a hat on. But that's not the country in me, it's just who I am. And if you see me driving around listening to Willie Nelson, I urge you to tell me to go home. <laughs> Because that's that's uh, when I'm starting to feel homesick. I, I, I start listening to things that I normally don't listen to. Because I start to feel claustrophobic in, in the city. I'll listen to the most insanely country of country music. Just to get some sense of, of home. So if you, if you see me getting in that, that position, offer to preach for me. I'll let you. And tell me to go home. So, sometimes we need to get back home and back to, to our roots. We need to get home at times to remind us of who we are and, and where we have gone and how we've gotten there. But there's also a downside to going home at times. People know who we are back home. They remember those stories from, from when you were in high school. The ones that you don't share at church because you, you don't want to be seen as being the rebel that you probably are. They remember the mistakes that you once made, and, and they know who your relatives are. We often can't see people from our hometowns as who they are. We only see them as who they were. This is not a bad thing if, if you were well known back in the day. But if you were not regarded as someone, uh, as one of the community's elites, it can be hard to overcome your past. <laughs> to be honest, I really don't know where I stand in, personally in my hometown. Because I kind of changed schools in the middle of, of high school, so I have two hometowns. And I wasn't at either of them long enough to really be the person. But I did help a lot. I got involved in many different things, but I never stood out. And I've always been involved in, in, in things. Even today I get involved in, in many of the higher profile activities, but rarely do people associate my name with what's going on, because I've always been in a support or an advisory role. <laughs> Jesus went back to his hometown. And our particular, peculiar human nature shows through in this story. 
He went to the synagogue to worship with the community, which was his custom. Throughout the gospel accounts, we see Jesus joining with others in the community in worship. As much as I'd like to say that theologically we don't need to gather together, I can't say it. I know that there is nothing theologically requiring us to, to participate in worship, to have access to the grace of God, because God is wherever we are. But I recognize that there is a human need for it. We need this gathering to encourage and direct and correct and promote our faith. If we neglect the meeting together, we will become distracted, and eventually the light that once burned bright will begin to diminish. And it will continue to diminish to the point that we will no longer even recognize that a light is burning or has ever even been there. Jesus made it his custom to worship. Even when the people around him disagreed with his interpretation of scripture, he worshiped with them. I want us to consider that for a moment. Even when the people in the community didn't recognize that his interpretation of scripture was right, he continued to worship. He continued to speak truth, but he didn't, did not let the difference of interpretation distract him from the point and the purpose of worship. When we come to worship, it's not about you or me. It's about God and us. Jesus went to his hometown. And on that Sabbath day, he was in the synagogue worshiping just like every other Sabbath day. And when the opportunity came for him to offer teaching, the people were astonished by what he had to say. Often we look at scripture and, and we assume that what we're seeing in the verses resemble what we're doing on Sunday morning. That's not necessarily the case. The psalmist says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Worship was the first and primary function. But that's just the beginning. The synagogue within a community was also a school, the library, the court, the place common concerns were discussed as a community. The synagogue was a community center within a community that was centered on the devotion to God. People would go to these places to worship, to learn, to raise awareness of issues going on within their community, and they went there to seek justice. The synagogue is, the seat of the, is not the seat of community within our culture. There are aspects where this, is the, where this has been the case in the past and, and in some other areas, but as a whole, this is not the place of cultural, this is not the center of our cultural experience. Jesus went to the synagogue to worship. And then when, when that meeting for worship was complete, he began to talk. And the conversation grew and questions were asked and answers were given and the crowd began to build. It was not uncommon for these sorts of things to happen. <coughs> It was common for teachers to travel among various synagogues to offer teaching because the synagogue was a place of learning. But what was uncommon was that Jesus was teaching in that synagogue. Last week we spoke about a, a synagogue ruler or, or leader, a man whose daughter was ill to the point of death, and that man risked everything even his reputation, to bring Jesus to his home to offer healing to his daughter. I mentioned his position, but we may not fully grasp what that position is or was. The ruler or the leader was, was the overseer of the synagogue activities. The leader is, is the one that the various teachers would contact to get permission to teach. 
they would go to the leader of the synagogue to se secure a meeting space. And after the after the and after that, the leader would promote the teacher within that community. It was important to make friends with the synagogue leader because they held power. And it was also important for the synagogue leader to maintain good standing within the community. That leader would seek, probably seek, teachers that would pre present a wide range of thought to, a given, to, to give to the community so that they would have the greatest amount of access to information. Because it would be from these teachers that the various schools of thought would choose rabbis to, to fill more roles within the communities. And if a child showed any promise, the teacher within that synagogue would recommend them for further training. So the ruler or the leader of the synagogue would seek these teachers trying to offer the best teachers that their community could afford to give their community the greatest opportunity to learn and succeed. Jesus came to his hometown without credentials. The synagogue ruler would not have given him a space to teach because he knew who Jesus had been. His teaching was not on the schedule and he did not have a room reserved. Jesus just simply began to teach, probably within a common meeting space where people gathered to talk. If it were today, it would have been where they, the coffee, coffee machine was, and where people were, were shaking hands and just getting ready to go into worship or talking after worship. Could have been the parking lot. We don't know exactly where it was. But he wasn't on the roster of teaching. And the crowd began to grow around him. And they were listening to him. And this astonished the leaders. Maybe they were astonished because no one showed up to their class. And they had a great lecture prepared. So they went out into the hallway and they heard someone talking. And they too were captivated by what was being said. Maybe they were astonished because they remembered Jesus sitting in their classroom when he was a young man. And the way that he was teaching was not something that they taught back in those days. Jesus was there, and he came to worship, and he and ended up teaching. And the crowds could not believe what they were hearing. And they began to ask questions like, where did this man get these things? Where is the wisdom that was given to him? How are such mighty works being done by his hands? They ask these questions, not because they disagree with what he said, but because they knew who he was. They knew that Jesus was the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and I can't pronounce Jose's name, I, I actually practiced it for about 30 minutes trying to get the name name right. And all I see is Jose. I don't see the Hebrew way of saying that name. James, and, and I'll just go with Jose, Judas and Simon, they knew those brothers. And they knew his sisters were there as well. They knew that he was a carpenter. This is an important an important word. Jesus was known as the carpenter. We don't fully grasp that phrase because our, our culture is a bit different. The synagogue was a community center, a place of community enrichment, education, history, justice, and worship. Everyone was part of the synagogue, which is why the threat of being thrown put out of the synagogue was such a great threat when we read through the Gospels. If you were not part of the synagogue, you weren't part of the community. So to be put out was saying that you had no part of who we are. You didn't have access to education, and you didn't have access to justice. You were outside. 
all the people within a community had access to a basic form of education. And unless a child was invited to learn under one of the rabbis, at the age of majority, that child would go home and learn the family trade. Jesus was a carpenter. He was the carpenter, is how they worded it. He went home to learn the family business. He was not asked to learn from the rabbis or given that opportunity to continue in a formal education. He was the carpenter. But notice again, that's not, that he wasn't only the carpenter, but he was also the son of Mary. In this society, men were recognized by their father. If we were to look at the list of the disciples, we, we, we have James and John, the son of Zebedee. And there's also James, the son of Alphaeus. And we even know that Peter's dad's name is Jonah. Several times in scripture, we see a prefix of bar, which means son of. But this community does not say bar Joseph which was Jesus' earthly father, the man that, that took on that role. The name of the house in the family business that he joined. They knew him as Bart Mary. He was his mother's son. Jesus lived the entire life with a stigma within a community of uncertain parentage. They didn't know who his dad was because of the timing of his birth was questionable. They knew his mother, and that stigma forced him to remain in a place within that community that was not elite. He was forced to remain as he was, a carpenter. He didn't have access to anything more. When Jesus came home, it is found teaching in that manner. It astonished the crowd because he was reaching beyond the place that he was allowed to remain. He was going beyond their expectations. And that movement within, that, within society threatened their very position. Imagine you're a synagogue ruler in Nazareth, and the rabbis you recruited failed to teach this man. And now he's up there teaching in front of them. Years later, he comes back to that hometown and everyone's looking at him and they're amazed at what he, what he had to say. And your crew is wondering how he got there. Not only is Jesus threatening the understanding of your teaching, but the very fact that he is teaching undermines your authority within that community. Jesus is a threat to the very fabric of what is holding that community together. I want us to just think of that. They took offense, not because of what he was teaching. The content was not the problem. It was who brought the message and who was part of the conversation. They took offense because the illusion of righteousness that they held was at risk of being exposed as being a fraud. They preached and they taught certain things, but their actions spoke differently. Jesus was not offered the same privilege as everyone else because he was the son of Mary. Jesus saw what was happening before his eyes, and the people were listening and, and engaging, and when the leaders entered the room, suddenly the tide began to turn. The crowd was reminded that Jesus was the carpenter, the son of Mary. Those few words suddenly sucked the life out of that room. And the people were, were reminded that they should not listen to Jesus. Because if they did, they would be sus suspected of supporting perceived sin. And Jesus says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty works there. We kind of pause.
pause and wonder why. Why could Jesus not do mighty works in his hometown? Was it because they didn't have enough faith? I don't think that's the case. They had faith in God. This is not a town that lacks faith. These are families that produced a young woman that could say to God, Behold, I am your servant. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I'm not saying Mary is sinful. I'm saying that she had such faith that she could say those things and offer her body to be part of God's will. And she came from this community. They taught her that kind of faith. It's not a town without faith. You don't get that level of commitment from the youth within a community without faith among the elders. They fully expected that God could do mighty things in their sight, but they, like many of us, expect those mighty things to come in specific ways and through the right people. Jesus could not do any mighty works among the people in his hometown for one simple reason. Once the leaders reminded that them of who he was, they walked away. Very few came to him to ask for healing. They did not want to lose their standing within the community by associating with the offspring of a, a scandalous event. This should teach us something about ourselves. Right after this encounter in his hometown, Jesus calls the twelve to him and he begins to send them out to the surrounding community with authority over unclean spirits. He charges them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. He left them specific instructions not to pack bread or a bag and no extra money. He told them to make sure they put on durable footwear, but not to take extra clothes. And Jesus sent these men into the surrounding community with the clothes on their back and the shoes on their feet and a walking stick. They had just watched the reaction of, that Jesus' hometown gave them. And Jesus turns around and tells them to just go out and faith to walk out into those communities with the assurance that they have the power that, to do what God is calling them to do and to expect that the community will provide for their needs. Yet they saw that Jesus' own community didn't. And the disciples went out in faith and they proclaimed the gospel and they healed the sick and they liberated those that were living in bondage. Yet the people of Nazareth at Jesus sitting in their synagogue. And there was not a thing going on there. Why? We have all that we need right here in our community already to do everything that God needs us to do. What is keeping us from seeing God move in mighty ways among us? The answer is we are. We're the ones that are stopping. We're the ones not letting that work flow through us. We look at the things around us and we do not see God. We do not see that God can overcome what's, what's the challenges that we're facing. We have accepted that we are too small to make a difference. We're too old to make changes. We've gotten comfortable and complacent. I want us to consider how we've acted towards people that may have been expressing a call to ministry in a greater way. Did we encourage them? Or were we hesitant? We're called to be representatives of the kingdom of God. We are called to bear the image of God and to represent him in a world confused and afraid of the shadows cast in the darkness. We are called to reflect the light of God into that darkness and to live with the boldness to cast out fear. That there is something that causes us to hesitate. There is something holding us back. 
there is something keeping us from participating in, in God in, in God doing mighty works in our community. I cannot tell you what it what might be causing you to hesitate. But I can't ex see what's going on in the wider community. <coughs> Just like Jesus' hometown, we label him. He was the son of Mary. We can't listen to him. We aren't for sure who, where he came from. Our own prejudices cause us to hesitate. They cause us to pause. The truth is, this meeting house and this meeting of the church should be like those ancient synagogues. This should be a place of worship, education, justice, and encouragement. We should be a center of, cultural, of, of culture and civility. We should be in, encouraging deeper thought and discipleship. God is greater than our political ideologies. He's greater than our economies. He's greater than our ethnicity and race. But he uses all of those things to teach us about himself. We need each other in all of our uniqueness. We need all of our stories, both of redemption and failure. We need all of our sorrows and our praises. We need our complete diversity of experience. Because when we know that, it can open our eyes to what God can do. And when we start to see what God can do, we begin to realize that God has and will use what we least expect to do mighty things. Capernaum got the glory of God's work. And Nazareth is seen as being a judgmental town. Not because of faith in God, because both believed God could do great things. But they became known in different ways because of how they treated those that bear the image of God among them. Let us always be able to see that of God in all the people around us. And let us trust that God can provide what he is calling. Call, God can provide for what he's calling us to do. As we enter into this time of, of open worship and communion in the manner of friends, I encourage us to consider Jesus' hometown and their reaction to who he was and how we're reacting to those that we know.